you know a band work and then uh, as a solo artist how do you see your like evolution as an artist culminating in the obsession oh that's a big one to start on um yeah, of course, there's been a lot of changes in the last couple of years um, and a lot of the development that I've been gone through, like on a personal and musical level, have been like heavily influenced by those circumstances. Um, but I feel. I feel that. Uh, I came out of that in a pretty fortunate way um mainly because when i was when i was starting the patreon for example i thought it would be a side project um just for songs that didn't fit what i was doing with delane um and i had no idea when i was doing that that i was creating something that would allow me to remain a full-time musician over both the pandemic and my band splitting up. Um, if I, at that point, would have to think like, oh, what am I going to do now? I, I probably would have kind of, it, it would have been much harder to do that then. Like I probably would have sank into a bit of a pit of despair first. Um, but I already had set it up. And I think that that kind of really helps on on the journey, you know, that you, you asked about. So, um, Yeah, so it's it's been it's been a journey. It's been a road, and um, like also like I started the I started the Patreon with no real production experience. Like it was really an experiment for me to learn a lot about that, and also to put myself to a challenge of the, of writing and recording and releasing a song like every single month, and to overcome kind of the self-critical part in myself that will start a lot of new ideas but will finish nothing because i would think that it was you know when is something done when is something good enough um so in a way i'm trying to reach a conclusion to your question but in a way like the obsession feels like the first traditional album kind of you know since since the band split um but i couldn't have done it without the tales records because i've learned so much doing those and even though they are completely different in ways that i'm sure we'll talk about later on in the interviews but even though they're entirely different i think that uh yeah they've been kind of an essential part of that road and i'm very happy that it led to me being able to do what uh, we did now with the obsession, uh, which I'm very excited about. It feels like maybe obsession introduces a bit heavier sound compared to your previous solo works. Um, how do you see the musical direction of the album? Mm, it is definitely a bit heavier and it, there are so many factors contributing to that. Um, like, first of all, I never really intended to go away from the heaviness, but it's just that when I started the Patreon, like it was supposed to be that place just for songs that were nothing like Delane. So anything that was heavy or that could be symphonic or metal, I would kind of bank that for like Delane songwriting sessions. So in the beginning, it was just songs that were completely different. But even after the band split, like I started to re reintroduce heavier things again. But I also kind of still enjoyed, you know, um, after 16 years kind of working within that framework to also try different things, you know, to to do a folk song, to do an electronic song, to do a pop song. So I've been experimenting a lot. Um, but then also, like it wasn't only different because of that, but it was also like later on for Tales Volume 2, for example, there were some songs on there that had potential of being like heavier songs. Uh, like even on Tales 1, actually, like songs like um, uh, Fuck Shit Up or um, 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 Human to Ruin or uh, The Phantom Touch, for example. Like 
they I feel like they potentially like I feel them as very heavy songs but then because they are kind of songs that were all made here in the basement on a MIDI keyboard like with programmed drums and programmed guitars like we also made choices in the mix there where if you put those too loud then you're going to you're going to hear that it's programmed you know so uh, and of course that's an issue that we didn't have with the obsession because um because we had timo and otto and joey like on the heavy section of the band and you know if you have those you're going to definitely put it loud uh, and then of course their very contribution uh, made it heavier as well like timo working on the guitar arrangement and joey on the drums like so yeah i kind of veered away from the heaviness part of out of curiosity part of out of practicality because of you know the things that i could do here um but yeah i started to think again when i wanted to do a traditional al traditional album effort again like what are the songs that make me you know make me the happiest and i feel that yeah the obsession is kind of a result of you know trying to answer that question and um yeah and the result is is heavier again uh i like it it feels like home for me you know what about the themes on the album then? Uh, I see like uh, fear, obsessive thoughts, escapism. Uh, what's the inspiration behind the themes and how personal is this album? Uh, very. Uh, yeah, like I didn't I didn't really intend to make something with like one theme running through it or, or like a concept record or something. But I remember very vividly I was I was in Poland on a residency and i i thought okay now i'm going to write down all the songs that i think will make it to the album and i'm going to write in one sentence like what they are about so i did and then i saw like yeah all, all these songs are either about fear and obsessive thought or like the very escapes from them and for me like i was diagnosed with ocd a few years ago and at first i really <clears throat> I didn't really identify myself with the diagnosis. I was like, yeah, sure, okay. Uh, as long you know, as I can get some help, I'll, I'll have the diagnosis too. But I think that over time, I started to understand more and more of my own behaviors and responses. And um, uh, in processing that, you know, I process a lot through music. So in processing that, um that came out in the songs as well having said that uh i don't think that this is an album that is like will only be relatable for people with a similar kind of diagnosis i mean in in the end it's about fear we all have our fears whether we like to admit it or not and we're all looking for ways to overcome them so um yeah i think it's a uh, kind of a universal theme song like uh, dopamine uh it may may be a, a pretty specific topic uh what inspired you to tackle such a topic and how do you hope that listeners connect with it well for me like the song was inspired by um also like a step in the process i, I was on antidepressants for a while uh certainly to be specific and I experienced this certain numbness that I had never experienced before. Um, it was very physical and I was very grateful for the medication. Like it really helped me. So it's not like a warning or something, but it was more that there were a lot of uh, side effects that I didn't know about. It was hard to find information about. People don't talk about it. It's, it's sort of taboo. And I thought that is kind of strange because I would have liked to know um so i thought basically i thought we we should talk about it this more like i think that in a lot of western countries by now one in ten people are on antidepressants so it's like sh should it really be a taboo to discuss then wouldn't it kind of serve the public to be a little bit open to it um and i thought uh, if i actually want to be a part of that then i should 
release these lyrics just as they are because i had considered at one point like it's it's sort of vulnerable um it's sort of vulnerable and very specific and do i want to have a line in there like you know i'm dying just trying to get off but then i thought you know if it's a taboo that you want to break you got to start somewhere so so there it is <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a very, very important, very important topic. And like you said, like uh, one in 10 and at least this end of the call is on medication. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so you. Yeah. yeah. So you already uh, touched on the effect of the band on the music. and But there mm -hmm. are also uh, collaborations with Alisa and Simone. How did these collaborations come about? Um, well, um, I I was actually talking about this, the effect on the medication, like in an interview a uh, while ago, a few years ago now. And um, this interview was aired. And when it was, uh, Simone actually reached out to me and she was like, hey, you know, let's chat, which I thought was very kind. And we connected and we hung out and we had some other collaborations in the meantime as well. And then when I released Dopamine in the first version on Patreon, because I've kind of made the Patreon a part of this album process where I still write and record like the first version of the songs here in the basement and I have the mix and I put them on Patreon. But after that, I started the whole process with the band and rearranged the songs uh, with Timo and um, had everyone perform their parts. So, but when I released that first version on uh, Patreon, um, someone texted me that she liked the song so much and that she had been playing it a lot. And I thought, you know, since we connected over that and she likes the song so much, it would be so great to actually release it as a duet with her. Um, and I'm very happy that she agreed and she recorded it right here in the in the basement in my vocal booth and um and it was so fun to record the video with her as well um yeah so that's really cool i'm really happy that it became uh, a duet as for um oh to the west wind um alisa and i uh, go way back as well uh, we met in 2013 uh, when delane was doing the first tour in the us um and We've been doing multiple collaborations over the years, like already with Delane on Tragedy of the Commons and Hands of Gold. And then we did Lizzie on Tips from Six Feet Under Volume One, which was really a pandemic project. And we did um, Fool's Parade, the beginning of this year. Um, and kind of a common factor in those songs is that a lot of them are based on classic poetry so um hands of gold uh, and fool's parade actually are both based on a poem by uh, oscar wilde uh, lizzie is based on a poem by elizabeth sadal and um o to the west wind is based on a poem called o to the west wind uh, by percy shelley so when I finished that one, I didn't have time to ask her for the initial version because a lot of time with these, like I, I write and release a song every month on Patreon. So, and a lot of times I, I do most of the work like in the last two days because, you know, deadlines uh, um, and procrastination. Um, but I could already imagine, like, especially with the topic and, and, I could hear the part where I thought like her vocals would be really cool. And um, can I just ask you when this interview is being released? Uh, ASAP. Okay, no, then <laughs> I might have to hold my tongue for a little bit. But um, yeah, so uh, so it was really great having her on on this song as well. And she actually she was in a very hectic time when we did the recordings. And she moved uh, heaven and earth to make it happen. So, um, yeah, so I, I'm really grateful for that. Uh, and I, I love Simone and Elisa so much. So I'm really happy to have them on the album as well. Releasing a song per month. Uh, what is kind of your trick into maintaining innovation in music? I think especially because you do it every month. 
there is no time to overthink things. Like, I can remember album processes where we were like, oh, I really want to make a song like this, you know? Um, but when you have to do a song every month, you don't really, you don't really have the time for that. Like I'm, I'm much more guided by direct, um, inspiration and deadlines. For example, this month I, you know, I hardly had any time. So then I was like, okay, so what can I do in a limited amount of time? And then I thought I could do a ballad because, you know, I could do like just a piano vocal thing. And, and then, you know, I had some lyrics that I wanted to put to music for a long time. So, um, yeah, often, often I'm just very guided by what is happening that specific month. And because, because this system doesn't allow me to procrastinate. So I never have this thing where at the very last moment I have to have 10 songs all of a sudden in a week, you know, like I take it month by month. So I kind of have the freedom to experiment or do something different because, you know, there will always be the next month um, if it's not something that's going to be on an album or something. You've been talking about your home studio, the six feet under. Yeah. It's right here. Like you cannot see my it but like my system is behind this and my vocal booth is right over there uh this is my uh, trusted mixing desk but we've got everything packed right now because we have our first festival gig um coming up in two days on saturday so yeah i'm very excited about that a little nervous working on your music in your home studio but uh, this time uh, uh having the band backing you uh in the recording so is is it gonna change somehow the way you're gonna work in the future? I really enjoyed the way we approach this process um, because, you know, I kind of still have the introspective phase at the beginning of the song, you know, where I, I do the songwriting just here alone. I make the first version because I, I've made this song of the month part of the album process where I put like I, I put a song out every month and, and songs of that could still end up on the album. But rather than with Tales from Six Feet Under, where I put the song on Patreon and then that was the end of it. In this case, it was kind of the beginning of it. So I, I made the song and I put it on Patreon. And then I started this process of thinking, OK, so if I put this on the album, what do I want to improve? And often that were already things like I knew like I wanted to extend a part, but I didn't have the time or I knew that I wanted more of an arrangement there, but I didn't have the time or or yeah, I felt like it still was kind of missing like a bridge or something, but I couldn't think of something like so. I first kind of went over those things like, OK, what do I what do I want to change like on a, on a really uh, structural uh, basis? And then I went into this um, rearrangement process uh, with uh, Timo mostly, um, who really worked on like the guitar arrangements, but also on making the arrangement ready for um, the band recordings. And that had a big impact on how the songs sound. Um, and after that, we did the, um, we did the drum recordings first. We did record separately, but when we did the drum recordings, we had the entire band there and they all played when Joey recorded the drums to ensure that we have this, um, band feeling like really this feeling of, uh, performing together, um, in in those first recordings already. And then everybody would kind of base their recordings on Joey's um, on Joey's drums. And what we didn't do, which is very normal in a lot of genres, but within uh, this specific genre, it's quite common to have like really like this machine like sound in the drums, you know, where it's really edited um, and like taken like strictly on the grid. But we we kept it like almost entirely the way that it just came out of those recordings. So it's more organic. And then everyone did their performances um, 
beautifully, might I add. So I feel like everyone had like, like obviously like uh, Timo could really um, zoom in and have like an impact on those tracks and Joey could really impact the tracks because you know, his recordings were kind of the starting point of all the other recordings. Um, Sophia got to record at um, Sandlane Studios, which uh, her piano and her, um, uh, she also did like a Hammond on the song Praise, which was also nice because she was actually recommended to me by Joost van der Broek. So it was kind of a full circle moment. And um, yeah, and then Otto and Timo record their vocals at home. I went over all the vocals again i didn't re-record them all like i kept some the way they were in the first versions because sometimes you know if it's not broken why would you fix them but i went over it all again with oliver phillips who i've worked with before and um uh and we also had i'm just telling you what the process is before i'm telling you what if i'm keeping it um and then um vikram shankar also had like a big impact because he made uh extra um key and orchestral arrangements and to be honest in the beginning i thought oh i quite like what i've done on the keys and the orchestral parts um and maybe i will just have like um uh an orchestrator work on one or two songs just to make it extra big you know but then i sent one song to vikram and i got it back and i was like blown away so in the end i sent him all of the songs i was like do your thing and um i really love what he did um uh, there's still some of mine in it as well, but I, I just, I sent him everything. It was also so funny because in the beginning I sent him like very long emails with, I would like this and that, and I'm looking for sort of this thing. And I sent him like mood boards with uh, visuals of what I wanted the song to feel like. And then in the end, I was just like, here's the song, do you think? Like it was, yeah, it was bang on every time. So. Uh, and then, of course, we had a, a wonderful mix by Guido, who has done all of my mixes and who also facilitated the drum recordings. And Andy van Dat did a great mastering. So I am. I really enjoyed this process. I think it was it was. It was really cool, and I. I really feel like the things that I wanted for the songs that they happened, like all of them, which is. Yeah, which I really think is special because sometimes you have something, you envision something and it and it is so hard to get there. And um, it was amazing to do that with this team in this way. So yeah, I'd definitely be up to doing it again like this. Um, it, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was a great process. Um, yeah, but also I like I am still doing the song of the month every month, so I can imagine, you know, now we're going to perform live, we're going touring, we have the release show, but in the meantime, I'm still releasing like a song every month. So if we want to do this again in this way, it's great because, you know, uh, by now I already have like a few new songs and by the time that we have toured and stuff, we'll we'll have like another big bank of songs that we can then choose to take kind of to that next stage. So that's very nice. It's also very now, nice now for patrons because they heard the initial version of all of the songs that they can kind of go back and hear like the difference between um, the the very first incarnation of the song. Um, and then then kind of the result of that whole process of rewriting, rethinking, and then in, in involving the band and like, uh, yeah. And in some songs it changed. Well, I think that in all songs, there is like a big improvement just by the fact that, you know, we've had a wonderful performing, performing them, but structurally, like in some songs, it changed a little. And in some songs, it changed a lot. I think dopamine probably had the biggest change because in the first version uh, on Patreon, that was just harp and vocals and, a tiny little synth and that was it so and that one then became like full band track so it's uh that one went through quite a transformation mm -hmm.